here is Amanda B. Jensen. Let me start by saying I will have a question and answer session afterwards, so if at any point anything I say sparks a question for you, just hold on to it and I'd be happy to answer it afterward. So first of all, um, are you able to hear me over the sort of din? Yes, a little. Shall I shout? <laughs> or, I think it's okay. Like, it's, I work with it, but it's, I have hearing loss. It's the best that we can do. All right, well. <laughs> what much better, right? <laughs> right. Okay, so first of all, um, why am I here to talk to you about DAOs? And if you don't know what that term means, don't worry about it. We'll get to that shortly. Um, but basically, I am a direct employee of the Dash DAO. Um, and I have been off and on for almost two years now. And when I first applied for funding from the Dash DAO two years ago, some people mentioned that they thought that that actually kind of made me the world's first freelancer to be employed by a DAO. And so that's kind of cool. And so I kind of, I have a story to go along with explaining to you how all of this stuff works. So before we get into a DAO, can we please talk about just like what is a blockchain? So. We can define a blockchain as many different things, and all of those definitions, hello, welcome. All of those definitions would be correct, uh, and for the, purpose, for the purposes of what I'm talking about today, I would like to define a blockchain as a business. It is a business. And I've run that by some people before, and sometimes uh, I, I get a little like, whoa, what? That's, that's not something you hear all the time. Uh, but when you consider the fact that in order to survive, a blockchain network must pay its expenses, that is, its uh, mining network most of the time, and in order to pay its expenses, it must sell its product, new coins, uh, you realize that we're talking simple revenue stream and simple payment of payroll. And so in that sense, a blockchain can absolutely be viewed as a business. And so, we want to ask ourselves, how do non-DAO blockchains make their business decisions? If you don't know, oh, please allow me to tell you. So what I would call like first generation blockchains or, or even those that didn't come out first but are following the first generation model, kind of like a la Bitcoin, uh, the way that they make business decisions, and actually first, let me define like in simple terms a business decision. What if I ran like a lollipop business and we produce pink lollipops? That's all we do. If it comes to the attention of anyone within our lollipop business that we might be able to make more revenue producing green lollipops as well, that's a decision that needs to be made. And once the decision is made, it needs to be then executed and rolled out into production. So that's what I mean when I say business decisions because Blockchains are edit, not the blockchain themselves, rather, the code base that makes a blockchain possible, being an open source and all of that, it can be changed. You know, you can upgrade the product, you can update the product. So how on earth, with these networks of people who most of the time have never met each other, they certainly, you know, weren't all hired by the same, you know, PR department, uh, how can these strangers come to an agreement on A, like what color of lollipops should we roll out? How should we roll them out? Who should we roll them out? And where should we begin you know, marketing them? These are, these are actually really serious questions. And so the way that most first generation blockchains do this goes something like this. Um, someone who has an idea about how the product should be improved or updated will begin floating it on a newsletter or a forum, or Twitter, or heaven forbid Reddit, but yes, Reddit also. And if they get the sense that there's sort of like momentum behind this change idea, uh, they'll you know, maybe send like an email to some of the people who have commit access to the current code base, basically the people who have control over changing the current product. And if that idea takes root, maybe it'll happen, 
But more often the idea doesn't exactly take root, or it doesn't take root in the form that the people who had the idea in the first place want it to take root. And so sometimes those people will then hire like a competing development team and they'll, you know, uh, make their own version of the software and then you begin to get what is often called a soft fork where two, two kind of groups of people within the same network totally like disagree on some aspects of their product and what we've seen happen in the crypto space's two biggest blockchains so far, Bitcoin and Ethereum, is actual splitting of the business results. So you can compare this to like, if there were some internal disagreement at Facebook, and a couple few months later, or even years later, we ended up with Facebook1.com and Facebook2.com. Okay. And that has happened within Bitcoin and also within Ethereum. And so the DAO model, and by the way, uh, DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. That term doesn't really tell you a lot about what it does, but if I may offer up a definition for it, I believe that a DAO is a way of taking basic business logic. How do we decide what color our new lollipops should be? Taking the, what, the basic business logic of all, how all businesses around the world pretty much run and making it explicit and hard-coded into your blockchain network. That's basically it. So, with the business, with business logic put into the blockchain, we find that two things are now possible in a relatively cheap and relatively easy to execute manner that maybe were like expensive and messy before. And that is governance, and that is funding. First of all, why would, why would we need governance or funding within our projects? Well, I've already talked a bit about you know, this whole, like, what color should the lollipops be? That's actually just governance. A, a governance is not a word that was very popular within the crypto sphere. In the earlier years, people were like, governance? We're way too cool. We're way too hip and decentralized. Welcome, Joel. For governance, don't need it. But then people began realizing that when it comes to updates to the product, oh, the process by which you decide to make the update, that is governance. And the second element that our DAO can execute, that any DAO can execute if set up correctly, is funding. Now what do I mean by funding? What needs to be funded? Well, what is currently funded in most first generation blockchains? Security. There you go. Security. That is the miners. And actually, hey Les, it is the miners who are funded the entirety of the blockchain's cash flow, the entirety, hey Vern, of the blockchain's revenue stream, right? So that's cool. I mean, every, every company needs security, do they not? But when we realize that our security employees are consuming the entirety of the business's resources, that there is not a single bit, not a single duff left for any other kind of job to be executed on the network, we begin to realize like, dang, there, there are actually a lot of things that need to be funded. Uh, not the least of which, actually the most of which is code base development. And what we've seen happen in networks that don't allocate their own cash flow to developers is that those developers quite naturally go wanting for a paycheck and they go looking for someone to write that paycheck, which usually takes the form of third-party corporate sponsorship. And you know, that, that's cool, that's a way to get a paycheck, and it works, but the problem that so often arises is that it creates, whether real or imagined, uh, conflicts of interest. Because anyone who is bankrolling the payroll for developers of a project is only going to want to do that if in some way their having done so can bring some form of return back to their own shareholders. And so you create this conflict of interest when you're asking someone else for a paycheck to help you work on 
a different project. And I don't need to spell out the kind of, you've seen this happen in the space. And so the other way then that DAOs kind of make us like independent businesses like we want to be is by taking some of the cash flow, some of the revenue, that is the block reward, right? The block reward, the newly created coins, and saying, hey, we love our security team. Let's definitely keep paying our security team, our miners, but let's not pay them everything that we have. Let's pay some of the other people, actually all of the other people that we have and need too, by basically splitting up the block reward. So, if I may tell you how these things are done, specifically within Dash. Um, that's, that's the main reason I've been asked to talk to you about this today, because uh, Dash is a comparatively long-running DAO within the crypto space. Uh, our network is over four years old at this point, which in crypto years, I, I think in crypto years you just times everything by 10. So in crypto years, that's like 40 years old, yes. And um, we've been running as a fully functional DAO for two and a half to three of those years. Uh, the DAO was actually rolled out in stages. So actually the first stage of the DAO was rolled out something like three and a half years ago. And the way that it works, let's start with governance. Who ought to govern Dash? Other than obviously the market itself, right? Because if the market doesn't think Dash is worth anything, the coin has you know, zero value. No one needs a DAO for a zero value coin. So assuming that the market thinks that we're worth anything, that they're the main governors, but in terms of making product rollout decisions, who should be making those decisions? Who should our board of governors be, in a sense? Well, in Dash, this was created in a role called the master node. The master node gets voting rights in exchange for doing two things. The first thing that a master node must do to earn a voting right is he or she, Peter, must lock down a thousand dash. And when I say lock down, I mean put a thousand dash into an address that they can cryptographically, or rather, which they do then cryptographically prove that they own. And this thousand dash does not need to leave their pose possession, and in fact ought not to leave their possession, even if they host their node remotely. And that's the second thing they must do. They must host a service node that remains online 24 seven, performing Dash's two key end user features, that is instant send and private send. I'm not gonna get into that today. So in exchange for doing these two things, being a proven investor, and performing service for the network, this person gets a vote. One master node, one vote. And so the way that this is used in determining you know, when to bring out new lollipops and what color to make them is we have something that we call our, our, like our voting cycle or a treasury cycle. The way it works is once every number of blocks I'm not even sure how, how many thousands of blocks it is, but it basically works out to be like 30 days long, like a month long. Within those 30 days, anyone who has a governance proposal that is like a prod product update idea for our network can pay a proposal fee and embed a hash of a, of a specific proposal into our blockchain and the master nodes can then vote on it over the course of those 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, if that proposal has 10% more yes votes than no votes, it is considered to have passed. And by the way, there are roughly 4,800 master nodes within Dash. So if provided something had zero no votes, it would need 480 yes votes to pass. And uh, more so if any no votes came in. To give you an example of how this has worked for our network in the past, I'll give you kind of like the most classic example, which is about a year and a half ago, maybe almost two years now, the founder of Dash, Evan Duffield, put a governance proposal into the network one day. The hash corresponded to a sentence which read, the Dash, or rather, Dash's block size cap 
should be increased from one megabyte to two megabytes? Yes or no? And within 24 hours, was it not? Within 24 hours, just a deluge of master node votes came in and consensus was achieved that yes, the block size should be increased within 24 hours. And that was that. And now that's a, that's like a, you know, that's a big high level vote that we had, but this governance process has worked for low level, low level stuff too. I almost like I'm wanting to laugh as I say this because I put in a governance proposal that had to do with YouTube. I'm not kidding. So when I was first hired to start making YouTube videos for Dash, there was an old channel that had been started uh, back when Dash was called Darkcoin, before the rebranding to Dash. And in my view, this old YouTube channel was competing with our newer current channel for keywords, like for keywords coming up in a YouTube search. And I thought, this channel has to go. <laughs> and, and I, of course, felt quite adamant about that. But it turns out that not everyone agreed with me. <laughs> Can you believe that, Vern? I know, I was laughing too. And, and over the course of like 24, 48 hours, like there's some sort of like flaming going on in the forums where I'm like, okay, um, you know, anyone who doesn't agree with me is stupid. And there, are, you know, a lot of other people were like, no, Amanda, I think you're not understanding. This old YouTube channel needs to stay for reasons X, Y, and Z. And it was feeling like a little flamey, uh, a little argumentative. And thankfully, someone reached out to me to save me the embarrassment of continuing to be the noob who's arguing in the forum. And they were like, you know what, Amanda? Will you please just make a governance proposal about this? This is a policy that affects our product. You should just make a governance proposal about it. And so I did. Yes or no, the old YouTube channel should be deleted. And Actually, it didn't pass, <laughs> which is fine because the important thing is, is that it ended the debate. It was just done. That thread that had existed in the Dash forum ended the moment that the votes came in in a decisive manner. And so this governance stuff, it's not sexy, but it is useful as all get out. It is as efficient as a blockchain system as I have seen. Now to funding. So back to that cash flow thing, the, the revenue thing. As many coins as we can sell, the, the supply and demand of our product will dictate our price, right? And our price per coin is available to be paid out to our employees. So we consider our employees to fall into three categories. The first category is miners. We pay miners 45% of our block reward. The second category is the master nodes, AKA the board of governors. We pay master nodes an additional 45% of our block reward. And that, if you've been doing the math, leaves 10% of our cash flow, of our revenue, that can be allocated to every other job that needs to be done. Basically every non-hardware job. That includes all development, there are one, two, three members of the Dash Core development team in this room right now, and all of their salaries depend on the master nodes voting them up, voting them yes in the affirmative every month. So in that sense, the master nodes are also like, they're like the HR, they're, they're more than HR, they're like the granddaddy bosses who, you know, like have the, the power to hire and they don't ever want this to happen, I'm quite sure, but along with the power to hire comes the power to fire, if absolutely necessary. Beyond development, we have market, market initiatives coming in to the Treasury. We have code audit initiatives. Uh, someone put in a proposal for Treasury funding to hire Bug Crowd. I don't know if you've heard of Bug Crowd. It's that uh, company that basically employ, like, puts out bounties for white hat hackers to look at code. Uh, so someone asked for treasury funding to hire Bug Crowd to just comb the Dash code base for any vulnerabilities that could have been missed. I apply for my funding to do PR work for Dash via this treasury system. 
And at current, the 10% of the block reward that I'm talking to you about here is 6,600 dash per month, roughly, which in US dollar purchasing power terms is around seven, between seven and eight million dollars worth of payroll capacity per month, which dwarfs uh, the budgets of even the major foundations of major players within the crypto space. Uh, our, our, our treasury budget dwarfs the foundation budgets of our competitors who have much higher market caps than we do. And so if I may just describe to you how it is that these payments are made, because I'll just tell you like how I get paid, all right? So once a month, I write out my work proposal for the next month. Like, hey, masternodes, this is what I did last month. This is what I intend to do next month. This is why I think I'm bringing a return to the network. And this is how much Dash I would like to keep working for you, for my team and I to keep working for you this next month. And I take a hash of that, and I, using my full node Dash wallet, I embed the hash into the Dash blockchain. And from that moment until the voting deadline, the master nodes are able to just, you know, clickety click, like yes or no. And if they vote more, 10% more yes than no, uh, which they always have thus far for my proposals, right? <laughs> like to keep that happening. Um, then when that, you know, that block number that says treasury cycle has ended has been reached, the payment shows <laughs> up within my Dash wallet. It appears as a mined transaction. There's actually like a little image of like a little pic next to it in my wallet to show like this was a mined transaction. And that's how it works for everybody. And how, that is how it works for you know, the, the grandest you know, OGs in Dash down to the brand new noobs, like just looking for an entry level job in the ecosystem. That's how it works for everybody. And so I hope that uh, you know, through describing how the Dash DAO works, I've been able to illuminate for you why, um, for example, a lot of new projects have been copying what it is that we do, which I see as a really great sign. And, and, and actually, I'm pretty floored by it because it's only through other people competing with us in you know, a, a very similar model to what we do, that the what kind of DAO is the best DAO question will be answered because there are variables. You know, maybe the treasury should be 15%. Maybe it should be only 5%. Maybe, maybe a master node should only have to s hold this much. Or maybe actually you should have to hold this much. We won't know uh, until basically we're just going to sit back and watch things play out over the years and see uh, which DAO is able to acquire the most customers and basically spread across the earth, more or less. And so, yes, so if you uh, would like to stay updated with what the Dash DAO in particular is doing, because by the way, we've been called like a governance coin or whatever, but governance is not like a product. Like it's, it's not a pink or a green lollipop. We can't sell governance, nor can we sell treasury. Uh, these are, the DAO stuff is just what we think is, needs to be running in the background in order for us to actually sell our end user product, which is digital. We're going for digital cash. We are aiming to be the first widely used, like Satoshi-esque version of digital cash. And so if you would like to stay updated on that, I would invite you to you know, follow me on Twitter if you like, Amanda B underscore Johnson. And with that, hey, welcome. Uh, I will now take questions if anyone has any, and thank you for coming. So uh, for anyone who didn't hear, uh, Vern asked, do I and does anyone else making a work proposal to Dash's treasury have to pay a submission fee every time? And the answer is yes. The reason for that 
uh, is that the submission fee acts as a security measure to protect us from like DOS attacks, basically. Um, without it, someone could flood, hello, uh, someone could flood our treasury proposal system with yeah, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, and that might, you know, er, break some things in the short term. And so, yes, so the proposal fee is required for every proposal that is put in, um, but does it reduce the budget that I or anyone else can work with? No, because it is widely accepted practice that everyone increases the amount of funding that they ask for by that fee to reimburse themselves. And in the cases that there is someone who wants to work for Dash but does not have the fee, cannot afford the fee, or rather cannot afford taking the risk that the fee won't be reimbursed to them should their proposal not pass, what I've been seeing is that they basically find like a master node, or not even necessarily a master node, just someone in the community who does have the funds, and they say like, hey, do you think my proposal would pass? Does it look good to you? And if so, would you, would you front the fee for me? And there are actually businesses popping up on the periphery of the Dash ecosystem of people who do precisely this. They will, if, if you don't want to pay the proposal fee yourself and take the risk that it might not pass, there are now businesses that will review your proposal for you and if they think it will pass, they'll front the money and, and um, sometimes act as escrow because quite often you're a new person, right? And so the master notes, if they can't shake your hand and look you in the eye and like call your former bosses about what kind of employee you are, they actually are taking like a huge gamble hiring a, a totally unknown person. And so these escrow fee paying services actually kind of help with that because it shows the masternodes at large, hey, uh, a long time masternode owner and business has vetted this proposal and if they think it's good and they think it's legit, like I feel better about that. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, you say. So Chris's question is, is there any fixed leadership within the Dash DAO other than the master nodes themselves and how they vote? And no, there is not. Whatever, whomever the master nodes hire is who is seen to be the best leader to execute that particular task at this particular time. And the interesting thing about treasury proposals, just, just a matter of who gets, who gets funded to do what at what time, is that that in and of itself answers a lot of governance questions. Because the master nodes would not vote to hire someone to perform a particular job if they didn't believe that that job should be done. And so the fact that any job is hired to be done answers the implicit governance proposal of should that job be done at all, which is nice. Yeah, Chuck, thank you for bringing that up. So if I may um, expound, people have asked things like, okay, so with no fixed and set leadership within Dash, who, um, like who owns you know, the trademark of Dash? Who owns the intellectual property? Uh, or, or if the Dash network um, invests in something that's like physical and expensive, you know, like a bunch of um, infrastructure or something, uh, or even just like a fancy pants website. Um, who owns that? And so what Chuck is talking about is, yes, uh, some members of the Dash core team, uh, I would consider them to be like the primary proposal holders in that they have the most employees and hence they request the most funds month to month. And they develop the code base and without a code base, all the rest is fluff. Um, so they Ha, seem to be in the process of forming a sort of new kind, well, traditional but new, of legal entity, I believe in a European country um, where these kinds of legal entities are like more fleshed out, which would basically, correct me if I'm wrong, appoint a custodian who is legally bound to do with the fund's assets or the legal entity's assets 
what the master notes instruct him to do via a vote. And so in this way, the, you know, the intellectual property or the this or the that, things that the network as a whole really owns, not, not just whatever person happened to you know, spin it up or, or register it somewhere, that in that way we can cast network-wide votes and there is a custodian with you know, like legal representation of these things who can then execute how they are dealt with. In terms of signing um, contracts, uh, so Ryan takes it on himself to ask for uh, all everyone who works under him within the Dash Core team. He asks for all of their salaries within one proposal. Uh, so yes, so so even you know Ryan, the CEO of the Dash Core team, as you say, he is absolutely um, reliant. On, a, on con constant approval of the master notes. Yeah. Jessica, did you, were you oh, stretching? No, or? Oh, got it, okay. Does anyone else have a question? You, sir. How many uh, master notes typically vote? That's a great question. So, the most I've seen was actually the proposal of yes or no, Dash should increase its block size cap from one to two. And at that point, over 2,000 master notes voted. And at the time, I think we had roughly 3,000 master nodes, and so that represented like a roughly two-thirds vote, and that is the highest that I've seen. More often, um, around between 1,000 and 1,100 master nodes will vote on like the highest voted upon proposals, but actually that's just in the affirmative. There are still some no votes coming in for some of those, which quite often or maybe like 100, 200, maybe even up to 300 no votes. So I would say on a given highly voted upon proposal, about 1,500 of our 4,800 master nodes are voting. And I remember coming across a question in the forums years ago, um, hey, it looks like only like a quarter of master nodes are voting. Should we make their pay contingent upon them voting? And that was a question that was debated a bit online. And the more I've thought about it, the more I think that it's actually a, a good thing that pay is not contingent upon voting because I have met numerous masternode owners myself who, you know, they'll basically come up and tell me something like, hey Amanda, you know, I love Dash, it's so awesome, I love being a masternode owner, but I gotta tell you, like, I am not reviewing treasury proposals every month. I'm just not, I don't have the time. You know, I'm doing A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And if that person's pay were contingent upon them voting, I think we'd be seeing a lot of just crap votes thrown out. And so the fact that the people who are voting are the people who are taking one hour two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours to review all of these proposals, I think it's probably the best results are coming out of that. So is the incentive to vote just? The incentive to vote is that you have a thousand dash on the line. That's the incentive to vote. That's a great question. For anyone who didn't hear that, uh, the gentleman's question was, how is it that all of the master, all of the voting master nodes can feel confident that they themselves are able to accurately evaluate the merits of a given proposal, if at all. And sometimes, some of them don't, which is why in addition to the option to vote yes or to vote no, there is actually an option to abstain, which says, hey, I saw this proposal, I read this proposal, but I really don't feel qualified to vote on it. However, a lot of times that is solved merely by some, some of these websites where the proposals are discussed. Um, you'll get people asking each other questions and people can prove that they own a masternode on these websites by uh, signing something with their masternode private key. So that gives them like a little badge next to their name, this is masternode owner. So that in these debates and discussions as to should we fund this or not, uh, you can look to those people with the badges and be like, okay, I think I'm probably going to take this person's opinion potentially more seriously than I might someone else because I know this guy has a thousand dash on the line. And what's more, um, more expert commentary is frequently sought. Like I've seen, 
I've seen discussion pages about a given proposal where a given master node owner will chime in and be like, you know what, Ryan Taylor, would you please come tell us what you think about this? Because I don't know what I think about this until I know what you think about this, Ryan Taylor. Would you come? And Ryan Taylor comes and you know he has his master node owner badge. Uh, so you know we know that it's him, he's verified his identity, he says what he thinks about the proposal, and usually, more or less, things can, can be figured out in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah, one more question here, and then I'll take a question here, and then I think we'll be finished. Go ahead. So the very nature of a permissionless network like Dash is just that. It is permissionless. Anyone who is willing to purchase a thousand Dash and have that on the line as well as spin up a service node for us that makes our service even better and easier and faster to use, they get a voting right. It's permissionless. Uh, and, and, and so in terms of what you're talking about, like a potentially malicious actor, that is where um, the, the thousand dash locking really shines because it makes us very resistant, first and foremost, to civil attacks. Because in other, in other networks that don't have a DAO, um, civil attacks are almost like, they can be kind of like congratulated because they, they're always looking for more nodes because the nodes are volunteer positions. I remember like, you know, a number of years ago, I think it was like BTCC, um, the founder, you know, threw out a tweet and he was like, hey, Bitcoin community, just letting you know, like as your Christmas present or whatever, like we at BTCC just spun up 100 new nodes, you're welcome. And everyone was like, yes, high five, thanks, man. Um, but you know, like in, in, other, in other senses, in other networks, that's like, you know, people would call that a civil attack. One person spinning up 100 nodes. And so this, this, this thousand dash vesting process really helps us get accurate views about what Dash investors want because you cannot spin up a master node unless you are highly vested in Dash. So, uh, and there was a final question here. Okay, so the gentleman's question is, have there any, ever been any particular conflicts that could not be or were not resolved via this process? Um, and the answer is no because there will always be a result anytime a governance proposal or a funding proposal is put up. The result will always be yes or it will always be no. There are debates about some things going even now, um, but they've not yet, and I don't know if they ever will be, made as formal proposals. Just one example of a sort of discussion that's kind of like heating up in Dash right now is should we, um, should we move the decimal place within Dash so that we have more units, but each unit is worth less, so that it makes it like you know easier to talk about. So like instead of saying, oh hey, would you please send me you know like 0 0.045 dash, you would just be like, would you send me 45 dash? That kind of thing. There's not been a proposal put up about it. There's been a lot of debate about it, and actually it's been going on for years. And so you know if there's no proposal put up about it, it probably will never happen. If there is one put up about it, we will know within short order whether or not it will happen. All right, thanks for coming out, everybody. Enjoy your day.